The president is acquitted of impeachment this week, delivers his State of the Union, and has a dust-up at the National Prayer Breakfast. The Wall Street Journal's Bill McGurn is here with analysis. And the persecution of Christians is on the rise all over the world, but what's being done about it? Hungarian Secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians, Tristan Osbe, will tell us. And finally, we remember the life and career of the Queen of Suspense, best-selling novelist Mary Higgins Clark, who recently passed away at the age of 92. We'll bring you that exclusive interview. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Great show for you tonight. Bill McGurn, Tristan Osbe, and a special remembrance of the late Mary Higgins Clark. It's all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. First, some news from the world over. President Trump, fresh on the heels of his acquittal in the U.S. Senate from impeachment, and his State of the Union address spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington on Thursday. Though he never mentioned impeachment at the State of the Union earlier in the week, this time he didn't hold back. When they impeach you for nothing, uh, then you're supposed to like them. It's not easy, folks. I do my best. More on that dust-up in a moment with Bill McGurn. And in the wake of the controversy over Pope Benedict and Cardinal Robert Sarah's recent book on priestly celibacy, a key prelate is playing less of a role at the Vatican. Archbishop Georg Gonswain, head of the papal household and private secretary to both popes, appears to be on an indefinite leave of absence. The Vatican press office confirmed on Wednesday that Gonswain's duties are being redistributed after questions arose about his part in facilitating Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's participation in Sarah's defense of celibacy. Archbishop Gonswain has not been seen at a weekly papal audience since January 15th, and he's missed a number of diplomatic events with Pope Francis at the Papal Palace. We'll have more on this next week with the Papal Posse. Joining me now with his analysis of the president's acquittal, the State of the Union address, and the ever-escalating tensions here in Washington, D.C., is Wall Street Journal columnist Bill McGurn. Bill. Thanks for being with us. I, I want to start, Bill, with uh, something from the president today. This was at, was at what was billed as an acquittal celebration. Uh, it turned into much more than that. I was present. Watch. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. Bill McGurn, uh, he's been holding up those papers at every public uh, event this day. Uh, you know, Trump acquitted, acquittal. Uh, first off, how does this affect the presidency going forward? And what do you think has been the political impact on the Democrats who pursued this crusade for the better part of three years? Well, uh, let's take the second part first. We know uh, what it's, how it's affected the Democrats. The president's approval risers ratings have risen the same way Bill Clinton's had risen after he mm -hmm. was impeached. Not quite as high as Clinton's, but I think uh, Gallup just put uh, President Trump at the highest ever for his approval ratings at 49 percent. So we know it didn't work politically. I think the Democrats thought if you impeach him, the support will come, and it didn't come. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, do you think this will have long term uh, a long term impact come 2020? I saw some uh, initial focus groups and, uh, you know, interviews with independents where they were very swayed coming out of this whole impeachment drama and watching that State of the Union address the other night. And they're moving toward the president as well. Well, I don't think they were ever moving away from the president, and that was, I think, Mrs. Pelosi's problem. Look, mm -hmm. she led a very partisan impeachment. The founders weren't indifferent to partisanship. That didn't bother them too much, but they had built-in safeguards. And I think what, what it showed is if you broke down uh, the polls by Republican, Democrat, or Independent, 
something like 90 percent of Republicans did not want the president impeached, and something like 90 percent of Democrats did want him impeached. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that the independents, and especially those in the battleground states, impeachment wasn't working for them. For a lot of them, it's just another Washington drama, mm. uh, you know, a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing, and they mm. just wanted, uh, they wanted people to get out of it, which, which I think helps explain why senators such as Susan Collins uh, voted the way she did. I don't think she was under any pressure to move to um, convict the president. Mm -hmm. uh, on Tuesday, President Trump gave his State of the Union address. He didn't mention impeachment there. Uh, but at the conclusion right. of that State of the Union, Speaker Pelosi engaged in this very dramatic coda where she ripped the, the <laughs> State of the Union address. Uh, she did it three times to make sure she was seen. Was this a misfire, an overplay, if you will, of, of uh, theatrics and, and gestures here on the part of the speaker? Look, absolutely. Well, for one, it confirmed. First of all, just by being there in the chamber, knowing that the acquittal was to happen the next day, President Trump looked strong, and it just underscored their weakness. That's the, that's the problem with launching an impeachment effort, and you don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up making—I mean, Donald Trump— at the State of the Union, look like Godzilla or something. You know, they're throwing, they threw their spears at him and they shot him with bazookas, brought out the tanks, and nothing, nothing dented. So, I, and a State of the Union in general benefits the president. He's, it's the most dramatic stage for American democracy. All three mm -hmm. branches of government are represented. So, I think Mrs. Pelosi just made herself look very small and the facial mm. gestures and so forth. Yeah. Now, they say President Trump snubbed her by not shaking her hand, but then she also snubbed him by not um, uh, adding a line about it is my high honor and privilege to introduce right. the president of the United States. I mean, I don't I don't think when you're the minority party, when you when you want the White House, that's the way to get the White House back. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think it it was revealing and coming from a long line of strong Italian women, Bill, uh, this is what happens when you when you cross an Italian woman, look out. And when I saw that, when I saw her start ripping those documents, I thought, oh, boy. But uh, I think the voter sees a vindictive If my daughter spirit. did that. Go ahead. If my daughter did that at a high school graduation, <laughs> I would be livid. Oh, me Even, too. And, and also, look, it, it's, a, it's a rule. It's a good metaphor because that's a rule all parties should have. You know, that some of the Republicans had this under Barack Obama. You have to go to it. It would be as if I invited you to my daughter's high school mm -hmm. graduation. You don't really know her. You know me. You have to sit through it. You don't know any of the other kids. Mm -hmm. So your job is to sit there and smile a little and just clap wanly for it and no one will notice. But when you make scowls and mm -hmm. faces and so forth, you just draw attention to yourself in a very unflattering way. And by the way, that's the speechwriter's um, goal, mm -hmm. to either get the other side to cheer for your proposals, to phrase them in a way that makes it hard for them not to stand up and cheer, or to make them look bad for not doing it. And I, I think the president's team did a great job. Yeah, well, short of a cattle prod, I think you, it would have been very <laughs> difficult to get some of these people to stand up and, and, and move at all at parts of this speech. But, uh, I, I but you know what? If they did, if they did, it would mean nothing. They would they just move on by not doing it. You know, no one likes the sullen right. look when you just announce, you know, record low on a play. It doesn't work for no. anyone. No, it's, or, it's or, or, politics, or so. sending or sending poor children in Philadelphia to school on a scholarship <laughs> of their going to a school of their right. choice, sitting there and scowling at that. It's probably not a good right. look. Uh, I want to show you this. This is Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is her weekly press briefing. She addressed the president's acquittal. He's impeached forever, no matter what he says or whatever headlines he wants to carry around. You're impeached forever. You're never getting rid of that scar. Your reaction, Bill McGurk? Well, that's true in a sense. I mean, that's one of the unfortunate aspects of weaponizing impeachment, that the president will be in a very small group of presidents who, who was impeached. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, he may make history as the only president who was impeached and then went on to be reelected mm. because he's the only one running. And we, I, I mean, people talk about um, weaponizing impeachment. In my newspaper, The Wall Street Journal, has yeah. rightly complained about how the Democrats have lowered the bar. What I worry is um, they've done it. It's even worse than that because there is no way that a Democratic president would have endured the fury 
that came not only from the opposition party, but the press. I mean, a lot of people in the press egged the Democrats on to do this mm -hmm. and so forth. We had we had chiefs of the intelligence service telling us mm -hmm. Donald Trump was a Russian agent. Yeah. That that kind of constellation of forces is never going to be there uh, against a Democratic president. So it's it's really only for use against Republicans in, mm -hmm. that, in that sense. Earlier in the morning at the National Press Breakfast, uh, or pr National Prayer Breakfast, not Press <laughs> Breakfast, they don't have one of those, but at the National Prayer Breakfast, President Trump took a stab at Mitt Romney, who voted to impeach him, and Speaker Pelosi, who, by the way, was in attendance on the same dais. Watch this. I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. Nor do I like people who say, I pray for you, when they know that that's not so. So many people have been hurt. And we can't let that go on. Bill McGurn, your reaction to this? Nancy Pelosi has often cloaked this impeachment drama in a solemn occasion, a prayerful occasion. She says she prays for the president. Your reaction to that kind of calling her out at a prayer breakfast? Yeah, I'm not sure that's the venue. I would have preferred, I think the president should have uh, opened the prayer breakfast by saying, I know, I first want to say, I know Mrs. Pelosi was, has been praying for me throughout this impeachment trial. And I want to thank her because clearly those prayers have been answered. Um, I think that might have been a better way to dispatch it. So, uh, look, people use their religious convictions to to vote and justify all sorts of things. I, mm -hmm. I don't see why that's any any less legitimate. What he's what he's claiming is that it's phony, um, and people are free to draw that conclusion. But again, that's that's not really for us to know, right? Mm. Yeah, well, I, you know, I also think it's, it's rather convenient to invoke faith when it doesn't cost you anything, you know, but, but on these right. big issues, religious liberty, uh, Christian persecution abroad, the right to life, uh, then suddenly faith vanishes. We don't want to hear from people of faith. Right. We don't want to talk about right. faith. So it's a, it's a yeah, very no, interesting... Then it's, then it's then it's the shouts of wall of separation. Right, right. Church and state. Remember that letter from Jefferson right. to the Danbury Baptist. Uh, during his speech at the White House on Thursday, after the acquittal, President Trump had this to say about what the Democrats might be planning next. I'm sure that Pelosi and Cry and Chuck, they'll do whatever they can. Because instead of wanting to heal our country and fix our country, all they want to do in my opinion, it's almost like they want to destroy our country. We can't let it happen. Bill McGurn, there, uh, there are voices from Capitol Hill saying they're going to subpoena John Bolton. The investigations right. will continue. The president in that talk even said they may even use the New York State to try to get at me in a different way. Your thoughts on this. Will this end, or are we just going to have endless uh, investigations and impeachment hearings until the next election? I don't think it will. It, look, the, the pattern has been, first, it was James Comey. There were FISA warrants on uh, people affiliated with the Trump campaign. Then it was Bob Mueller, and that faded. And uh, then it became impeachment. They're, they're just not going to give up on, on this. I'm not sure it helps them. Let's say also the Republicans are doing some of the same. I mean, I believe there's a Senate investigation now into Hunter Biden. So um, I think it's going to be a lot of noise, but largely in the background. I, th I think people may be tired of it. Again, I think the surveys of uh, voters in the battleground states, particularly and particularly the independents, mm -hmm. show they're not, they don't really have an appetite for this. They want people to move on mm. and, uh, you know, get the business done for the American people. Yeah, no, it's a moment, it's a moment for unity. And I think this kind of uh, toxic attack and viciousness, uh, it's not what the, I don't think it's what the people want. And the Gallup poll would seem to indicate Trump's at a 49% at approval rating. That's the highest since he took office. And Republicans are right. at a 94% uh, approval rating, which is pretty astounding considering it's the Republican Party. Uh, it, now, I want to show you this. During all through these impeachment hearings, Trump has been hmm. rallying those supporters that he has and recalling his record. He signed that big trade pact with Canada and Mexico that people said he couldn't get done. The China trade deal is moving forward. And then at the National Prayer Breakfast, he said this about religious liberty. 
To protect faith communities, I have taken historic action to defend religious liberty, including the constitutional right to pray in public schools. We are upholding the sanctity of life. Sanctity of life. And we're pursuing medical breakthroughs to save premature babies because every child is a sacred gift from God. How important are these issues, Bill McGurn? And have you ever seen a president so vocal about this right to life? No, I think there have been, I mean, most of the previous Republican presidents have been pro-life and have made their own contributions and so forth. Look, I wrote some of George W. Bush's speeches mm -hmm. on it, and he had some, some very good language. But I think, uh, uh, President Trump, it's good to not just be for them. The difference is, I think, his supporters, especially the supporters who are fighting for life, they feel the president's really with them. Look, he, mm -hmm. he was the first president to actually go to the rally yeah. and speak to people there, not keep them at arm's length, like, you know, phoning it in from Camp David. So I think right. it's a big thing. You know, you mentioned the popularity. I, I think going forward that the, I can understand Donald Trump wants to get it off his chest, what he really thinks of these guys now <laughs> that he's free. But I think that his, um, his, his fortune lies in being more the Donald Trump of the State of the Union. I, we've done these great things, mm -hmm. but greater things are to come and to rally people and really be presidential. I mean, the thing about the State of the Union is, even though the Democrats didn't applaud, you're reaching beyond them to all the American people mm -hmm. and inviting them on the journey. And I, I thought it was very impressive. Uh, and I think that if he sticks to that, uh, he has a very good message going in. Now, Bill, you were the you were the head of the speech writing for for George W. Bush. Your reaction to the staging of this State of the Union? It really was a produced event. You had these rip your heartstring moments: the Tuskegee Airman and his great grandson, right. the little girl who got the Opportunity Scholarship. You had right. families reunited, uh, the Rush Limbaugh uh, Medal of Freedom. Your thoughts on the staging of that? Some say this is just a reality television star turning the State of the Union into that. Your thoughts? Well, you know, you know what? Um, people say that, like, for the, um, the, uh, the family that was reunited, reunited mm -hmm. with their, um, the dad from Afghanistan, the start. But, you know, it, it's, it's not a joke. It's not Oprah-esque for those people. For those people, it's, it's really real. Look, I watch, there's a whole show, right, TV show about the homecomings. Right. I watch it. I love seeing these families. And it, it's a reminder to everyone else how grateful we are for these people who serve and for the families yep. and what they sacrifice back here. So I thought the staging was great. Look, yeah. the goal of a State of the Union uh, when you're when you're writing it, as I say, is to get the other side to cheer your things, mm -hmm. to put faces on policies yep. and and decisions, and that's why you have those people, and to um, to make it very difficult for the other side to not applaud or to boo resist yeah. what they're doing. And I thought I thought Donald Trump really did a great job. I mean, one of the underrated things about President Trump are his set speeches. I think his team has done not just mm -hmm. here but at the UN. I think of the State of the Union two years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was a great theme um, last night. Yeah, no, no. I, I thought it was beautifully executed. And those moments, you know, it did remind you the cost of the deployments and the thousands of men and women, right. mothers and fathers, who are fighting on our behalf and separating right. from those families. It drives that reality home. And I thought I, I was I was very moved by it. And not only that, there were moments, and usually State of the Unions, I mean, Bill, you know, your, your eyes glaze over after about 40 minutes. This was very different. Uh, speaking of voters and reaction, the DNC chair, Tom Perez, is calling for an immediate recanvassing of Iowa. The announcement came shortly before Bernie Sanders claimed victory Thursday uh, in a race that officially remains too close to call. Your thoughts on the way this Iowa canvassing was handled on the Democratic side, and what does this tell us about the competency of the party itself going into 2020. Well, I don't, I don't know what larger lessons we could draw. Clearly, the folks in Iowa, the Democratic Party, just blew it. And it's not just the app. It seems to me that the bigger failure, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, would, you should be prepared for an app to go down or something. People have been calling in for years, the results, right, for decades. Right. They obviously didn't have enough phone banks or ways for people to call in 
uh, call in their numbers. So uh, I think it's really bad. It's a re it is a disservice to the candidates because if you're a candidate that has calculated, I'm going to put everything in Iowa because it's so important here, and then you're deprived of the victory, uh, even though you might be named the victor later, you know, part of this is people wait up all night. Right. You've got your volunteers who have been out there drinking cold coffee and eating <laughs> stale pizza, and you rally them by saying, you know, your work paid off. So mm -hmm. I do think that the candidates have a legitimate complaint. I don't think the results, I think if they recount, I'm not sure the results are going to be much um, yeah. much different. Yeah, than, I'm not uh, wild about now. I've never been wild about the Iowa uh, caucus. Uh, I've been there several times. I like the there. Iowa caucus. You do? Why? I think it's musical well, chairs like with a side of bullying. I'll I mean, I I'm not crazy yeah. about it. I'm not, because I, what I hate in the United States in politics is that everything goes toward dull conformity, right? Uh -huh. the, the primary system. You know, the caucuses, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm not sure I would want to do it. You have to commit several hours to doing it. But if the people of Iowa like that, it, you know, it has some, it has some points. People go, mm -hmm. someone makes a speech to try yeah. to draw. The, I, I, you know, to do it, we're going to do it all the same and then pretend we're not going to have any problems with, um, with the regular elections or regular primaries. I, I'm not sure. So my point is, I'm not sure it's the caucus system. There are only a few left. And remember, mm -hmm. the caucuses gave Barack Obama a way into the presidency over Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we should be cutting off avenues to the presidency. In the same way, if, um, if Michael Bloomberg can uh, get people to pay attention to his message by spending money on ads, I'm for that, too. Mm. OK, Bill McGurn, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for the time. You can follow Bill McGurn's commentary at the Wall Street Journal at WSJ.com. Bill, thanks again. Thank you. Secretary Tristan Osbe is straight ahead. But first, some news. The president of Nigeria's Catholic Bishops' Conference is imploring the West to make known the atrocities being endured by Nigerian Christians. According to the Archbishop of Benin City, his country is suffering the worst persecution since Nigeria's civil war in the late 1960s. The archbishop is highlighting the fact that 95 percent of Nigeria's government is Muslim in a country that is roughly half Christian. As many as 32 people were killed in attacks last week, and recently four Catholic seminarians were kidnapped, one of whom was later executed by jihadists. More on the problem of Christian persecution in a moment. Here with me now to discuss the plight of persecuted Christians and the steps his country is taking to assist them is the Hungarian State Secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians, Tristan Ospe. Mr. Secretary, thank Good you evening. for being here. Thank you for hosting. Uh, I want to start with this, this uh, program you all have instituted, Hungry Helps Agency is what you call it. What does it do? And I know it deploys resources to uh, regions throughout the Middle East, Africa, particularly where Christians are being persecuted. That is true. Uh, my complete title is State Secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, unfortunately, I must uh, add, I'm the only government official in the world currently that has persecuted Christian in its title. And mm -hmm. that is because the Hungarian government has decided to start a specific aid program dedicated to Christians who suffer innocently because of their faith in, in, in Christ in, at the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. it, it was already an achievement because we sent a message about uh, that uh, Christian persecution has to be dealt with on the governmental and, uh, mm -hmm. level and, and by the international organizations. But it, it's not about only the department. Of course, at the same time, we have started a humanitarian aid program for persecuted Christian communities in the Middle East and Africa, and we are always exploring how we may help other mm -hmm. communities as well. Now, our Secretary of State in the United States, Mike Pompeo, announced this International Religious Freedom Alliance, of which yours was the first country to take part. Tell me about why you wanted to be part of an alliance and how uh, widespread do you hope this will become? Well, religious intolerance is one of the, the greatest crises of our time. I just heard uh, from President Trump's speech that uh, about 80 percent of the world's population are, are living in countries where the, the freedom of uh, religion and belief are, are degraded or, or taken away. Now, besides uh, this fact, uh, there is another 80 percent 
that we have to, to mention, 80% in the world out of those people who are persecuted for their faith are Christian. So mm -hmm. four out of every five person who is persecuted for their beliefs are Christian, but the, but the world does not talk about this. Mm -hmm. Christianity is the most persecuted uh, religion in the world, yet the big international fora, the big uh, human rights organizations are not dealing with this. So we are proud uh, that uh, Hungary was the first government to, to take this to the governmental level, but we, we commend uh, the, the U.S. Uh, government to being the champion of religious freedom uh, in general. Mm. And uh, the USAID is now using your program as a model. Tell me specifically how it deploys resources and personnel to various regions, and why is the emphasis on helping these persecuted minority Christians remain in their homelands? Why is that the focus, rather than bringing them to safe harbor elsewhere. So, so there is there, there are few uh, principles that we follow that are different from other governmental humanitarian aid programs. Mm -hmm. One such, uh, some people sarcastically say it's an innovative uh, approach, mm -hmm. is that we first ask how we may help. Mm -hmm. we, we don't try to be smarter than what we, who, whom we, we support. We go there, mm -hmm. we go to that, those communities. Personally, I've been to the Middle East, to conflict zones in Africa, and we ask one simple question, how we may help. And they, they'd like to remain at home. Yes, Most of them the want answer, to stay. 99 percent is not, uh, not something like help us to migrate to Europe or mm -hmm. North America. Please help us to remain in our ancestral homeland. The, the other special feature of our program that we try to inspire other governments to, to follow the example is that we donate directly. We donate directly to, to church institutions, to faith-based uh, charities. We are not giving our, our money, which is the Hungarian taxpayers' uh, money, to big convoluted uh, international agencies like mm -hmm. uh, UN programs. First, because sometimes these big uh, convoluted agencies take up to 35 percent of the donation as administration costs, and also there are several points where they can divert the funds from the most vulnerable minority Christian communities to perhaps a, a majority community. So, in our case, the Hungarian taxpayers' money, which is also the manifestation of the Hungarian nation's uh, solidarity, mm -hmm. goes directly from the Hungarian state treasury to, let's say, a Christian community in Iraq or, or even in uh, Nigeria. And you rebuilt a town in Iraq, I mean, a village. Tell me about that program. It was in the Nineveh Plains. Yes, we are active in, in uh, quite a few countries, but probably one of our most important programs, because the hope it carries, is uh, on the Nineveh Plains. It's supporting a small Christian town called uh, Telaskuf. So once again, we are talking about the Nineveh Plains, biblical lands. Christians mm -hmm. have been living there for mm -hmm. 2,000 years, uh, up uh, until uh, 2014, uh, when uh, Daesh, or the, the, uh, the terrorist organization ISIS, have mm -hmm. occupied uh, this uh, small town, and everybody had to fled, mm -hmm. flee who couldn't uh, flee was murdered on the site. And then it was uh, freed in 2016, but that, by that time, obviously, it was completely deserted. Right. And also 900 buildings were, were damaged. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Hungry Helps program stepped in, and we donated directly to the Chaldean uh, Christians of Iraq, uh, an amount that is less than $2 million. Uh, and they, they completely reconstructed Telskov, and close to 80 percent, uh, 1,000 families out of 1,300 families have returned uh, to this yeah. village. And this is remarkable because otherwise, uh, during the conflict in Iraq, the number of Christians has dropped dramatically from 1.5 million to 250,000. Yet, with a relatively small direct donation, we managed to save a community. Mm. And you know what is uh, wonderful about this project is that uh, once uh, the, the locals have returned, they, they renamed uh, their uh, village or town from Telaskuf to Telaskuf uh, bin Tel Majar. Uh, excuse my Arabic pronunciation. Yeah. It means Telaskuf, daughter of Hungary. Ah. Which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a humbling experience to be a part uh, of this program. But really our message and want, what we want to achieve that to the town that is called daughter of Hungary, there should be uh, a son of the United States or, or, let's say, grandchildren of the European Union and the United mm -hmm. Nations and so on. We want to inspire other governments based on the right. efficiency of this project. I want you to talk for a moment about what's happening in Nigeria. This is getting very little 
press attention in the West, but we're seeing what people on the ground are describing as a Christian genocide. You have mass graves, uh, Boko Haram going into villages, uh, uh, kidnapping uh, seminarians, one whom was killed a few weeks ago, a pastor beheaded. Uh, you've, got, you've got a government proxy in these Boko Haram herdsmen who are going in and basically wiping out the Christian population. What can be done? Why aren't we hearing more about this on a media as well as a governmental level? Earlier today, I was at an event about uh, saving persecuted Christians, and we heard a, a very tragic testimony from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, that there was a priest who told us that only this January, last month, 630 Christians were murdered in northern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then, then I stood up and asked the audience, "How many of uh, how many have you how many of you have heard about uh, this massacre?" on the, the news cycle of CNN or, or BBC or the mm -hmm. ma ma media outlets. And of, of course, the answer is none, none. It's, it's, it's not only the greatest uh, human rights crisis of our time, but also the most uh, concealed. And we can explore the reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, some yeah, of why is it? And you've been very critical of the EU, uh, who has been really unwilling, refusing to acknowledge that there's even a Christian persecution going on anywhere in the world, much less Nigeria. I would like to uh, be naive and say that this is only lack of information or, or ignorance, but uh, uh, my position is that there is a political, ideological reason behind it, a very vicious one, and that's that it simply does not fit the general liberal narrative. The general liberal false narrative is that Christianity is an oppressive uh, religion, it's the religion of the crusaders, it is, it is harming others', others uh, rights. And, you know, the truth does not, fact, uh, not, not, does, not, does not fit the liberal narrative, and the truth is that Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. There are 260 million believers who are discriminated or persecuted mm -hmm. because they're facing Christ in the world. Wow. Uh, tell me for a moment about uh, the EU criticism of Hungary. Since 2015, they've, they've said, look, w they set uh, quotas for acceptance of refugees. They claim you haven't been willing to accept those quotas, even accepting Christian refugees. Why not? Well, I have to go back to 2014, and that's when a massive uh, wave of illegal migration has arrived to the borders of Hungary, which, by the way, also the border of the European Union's free movement uh, zone. We had uh, more than 1,000 illegal border crossings uh, mm -hmm. a day. So what we have uh, done, not because of, uh, only because of the security of our people, but because of legal obligation imposed on us, right. we built a border, border fence. So the, the rate of illegal border crossings have dropped from one to, more than 1,000 a day to, to zero. Mm -hmm. And it has been heavily publicized by the pro-migration pro liberal uh, media. We have been portraits as inhumane. But uh, what has been less publicized, at the same time, we increased, we, we doubled the humanitarian assistance that we provide in the source regions of migration. We believe that migration is harmful for everyone. It creates social tensions in the, in the receiving communities. It takes away the, the young people uh, from the, the source communities, uh, and, and it uh, exposes the migrants to life-threatening uh, routes and, and journeys uh, towards, for example, the European uh, Union. So we, our position is that uh, instead of importing the problem where there is none, we should take the help where the problem is. So this is why we are supporting all people uh, in, in the source regions of the migration, which are also usually conflict uh, zones. But mm -hmm. among them, uh, we sp place a special priority on the most persecuted communities that are the, that, that are the Christians. Mm. Uh, tell me about other countries collaborating with you. I know you had a conference where you, there, there were 40 countries that participated. Who are coming forward now? And uh, obviously, the United States is one of your partners. Who else has signed on to this effort to focus on particularly the Christian persecuted around the world? Yes, that is a very important part of our mission. It is a diplomatic mission to convince more and more governments to create an international alliance of mm -hmm. like-minded countries for the persecuted Christians. But I must uh, tell you that it was a very difficult mm -hmm. um, mission. We, we didn't get responses. For some reason, there is really? no solidarity for these uh, Christian communities. The so-called culturally Christian West has almost completely abandoned uh, these uh, communities. Mm -hmm. 
but a major breakthrough uh, was our cooperation with, with the U.S. Uh, government and another government uh, with whom we already have programs in the Middle East uh, from the beginning of our program are the, the government of Poland. Mm. Now we are in talks, we are trying to, to ex expand, we are in, in talks with the UK, for example, with the, with the Netherlands, right. and uh, hopefully something is forming and yes, we Boris, will manage to make a change. I, I saw Boris Johnson is beginning to raise the issue of Nigeria. Um, it, that seems to be a breakthrough and a departure from what was there before. Uh, any glimmers of hope there that you might be able to forge an alliance with the UK? Yes, actually, in this phase, we are ev evaluating a joint uh, project uh, for the, the female victims of uh, sexual abuse by the mm -hmm. ISIS fighters. At this point, I cannot announce anything. We are exploring the uh, opportunities. But here's the point. During the course of two and a half years, uh, through our program, we have reached and, and supported 70,000 persecuted Christians either to remain in their homelands or, or return uh, from, from their, their migration and, and such, uh, w which is perhaps remarkable, but comparing to the number that there are 260 million Christians persecuted, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. Yeah. And no one can accept, uh, expect from Hungary, which is a country of 10 million people. We have our own development uh, aims uh, in, in, in Central Eastern Europe. No one can accept, expect from us to, to solve a global uh, crisis. So this is why it is important that we may inspire other governments. Well, we, we hear from the EU, we hear from the UN about human rights, human dignity, the dignity of girls, the dignity of women. That dignity, all of those dignities are being offended every moment, particularly now in this Nigerian situation. Without some kind of international cooperative, I don't know how you ensure to those lives are protected and they're free not only to live, but to worship as they choose. I don't see how that's possible. Indeed, there is a terrible double standard. Terrible double standard. I mean, mm. when there was a, a vicious attack against innocent Muslim people at Christ Church, mm -hmm. the whole world was griefing. Right. Uh, and there was outrage, and, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. We also uh, condemned the situation and, and felt solidarity with the victims. The, the world needs to commemorate mm -hmm. the innocent uh, martyrs. But at the same time, you know, just last January, there were more than 600 uh, Christians murdered on, on based because of religious intolerance in the world. And there is not a single word about it. No. And it, it suggests a terrible uh, idea that the lives of Christians wouldn't worth as much as anyone else's. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. human dignity of Christians wouldn't uh, birth as much as any, anyone else, and we completely reject that. That is clearly in, inhumane. So this mm. is why we are not only um, running a humanitarian aid program, but we are trying to be the voice of the, the suffering people who are not heard. Secretary Tristan Osprey, thank you so much for being here. What a joy to be with you, and I hope you'll come back again. Thanks thank for you the for what you're doing. For more information about Hungary's efforts, go to hungryhelps.gov.hu. Finally tonight, some sad news. Known to her legions of fans all over the world as the queen of suspense, novelist Mary Higgins Clark passed away on January 31st. She was 92 years old. She was a New York Times bestseller, a legend in the publishing world. Since her first novel, Where Are the Children, was published in 1975, she sold hundreds of millions of books all over the world. I sat down with Mary in 2013 at her home in New Jersey to talk about her amazing life, her writing process, and the faith that fueled it all. Here's my interview with the late, great Mary Higgins Clark. You've been doing this for 40 years, 40 plus years. How do you keep in touch with that audience and describe that audience for me, if you would? Who is well, the Mary Higgins Clark reader? Well, she can be anyone or he. Mm -hmm. I think I'm primarily a woman's uh, author. Mm -hmm. But because I don't use explicit sex or violence, mm -hmm. I can be age 13. Yeah. The teachers put me on the list at age, at age 12. Mm -hmm. Because the kids are not, well, now, of course, the young adults are getting much more sophisticated, yeah. much racier, mm -hmm. even, if you want to use that word. But, I mean, all these years, the teachers and the mothers knew they would never be object to a book. They didn't have to read it mm -hmm. before giving it uh, to a young person. Yeah. And I always loved the Hitchcock way of telling a story. Mm -hmm. 
footsteps on the stairs. Hmm. You're alone in the house. Yeah. You've locked the bedroom door. Mm -hmm. You know that there is a serial killer in the neighborhood. The police have warned everyone. Mm -hmm. The handle of the door turns, and even though it's locked, it starts to open. You reach for your cell phone, and it slides out of your hand. Mm -hmm. I want that kind of writing, mm -hmm. as opposed to he shot her in one eye to see the expression in the other. <laughs> yeah, well, <that's... laughs> Which is one of the great lines, Mickey's Blaine. Yeah, it's a great, great line. It is a great line, but it's not Mary Higgins' Clark. But it's not Mary Higgins' Clark. Yeah. And it's not tearing the clothes off. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a choice, both artistic and moral, personal for you? It was natural. It's not something that I thought about. Mm -hmm. It was a natural choice for me to go that way. And it's not that I criticize racy books mm -hmm. or, or uh, violent action books mm -hmm. by any stretch, but it's not my way of telling the story. I want to go back a little bit because in all your books, bad things happen to really nice people. Which happens all the time. You're, you're, you bet. And your life has not been untouched by tragedy and loss. You lost your father when you were not even 11. Do you know it's 74 years ago yesterday, and wow. you never forget it? Hmm. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That day is as clear in my head as, hmm. as though it was yesterday. Wow. How did, you learn, how did you learn that he had died? I came home a nice Catholic girl from Sunday ma from Saturday Mass in the month of May, uh -huh. and the police cars were around the house. Uh, wow. And then you lose your husband. You have five children. He was with you for 17 years? No, 14, 14 years, years and nine months. Wow. And that's going on 50 years. Can you imagine? But what, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And tell me for a moment how your faith helped you through that moment. Here's a woman. Suddenly your husband's gone. You've got five children that you not only have to raise, you have to feed and educate. A heavy burden for a woman, particularly at that time in history. Well, the point is, I loved having five. I wasn't even sh sure whether I might be pregnant. And I'd always said, I miss Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but mm -hmm. I, for a few months, I simply wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could handle six as well as five. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're... In your early 30s, everything is possible. Now when I see the young girls with one kid running this way and one the other, and I think, how in the name of God did they do it? And I thought, we all did it. Yep. We all had a second car that was absolutely useless. <laughs> we had a two-door car, and one door didn't open. Uh -huh. The only door that opened was the driver's door, which meant you had to leave the kids out in the middle of the street half the time. <laughs> We didn't think anything of it. Hmm. We were all young and broke, but everybody was smart and everybody was becoming. Hmm. And you, how do you hold a job, raise five children, and find time in the mornings to write, Mary? Well, the, the, the thing is, it's really not remarkable. How many people get up and do yoga at five? Well. <laughs> you know, think about it. Yeah. Or go yeah. for a swim in the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of that... I got up at five, and I wrote till quarter of seven. Mm -hmm. Then got the kids up, and I always fed them, and it wasn't things you pop in the toaster. No, you had to actually you, cook. You really made things mm -hmm. for them. And at quarter of eight, the uh, carpool came, you know, and then they were off to the school buses, and then the carpool came. Mm -hmm. And it was a joke that I wrote in with my brother-in-law and one of the men in town, and they said it was indecent to look in the back seat of the car because I was literally getting dressed. <laughs> My dress was unzipped. <laughs> I was carrying stockings and shoes. The curls were in my hair. <laughs> my friend, whose husband drove, said, Mary, what, what, what color rollers are you using in your hair this week? I just found pink ones in my car. Are you sure they're yours? <laughs> I they're said, yeah, checking. I have pink rollers this week. She said, okay, I don't have to worry. <laughs> now, did you always know you were going to be successful, even during that period? I always knew. I never dreamt I'd be this successful. Of mm -hmm. course, I didn't dream that. That's just incredible. Mm -hmm. But uh, I knew I was going to make it. After school, I went 
took the subway to downtown. First the elevated, and then it became mm -hmm. the subway. Mm -hmm. And I worked at the Hotel Shelton mm -hmm. as a telephone operator wow. from four until seven, three nights a week and weekends. Oh. And if I got down early enough, I would go walk over to Fifth Avenue. That's on Lexington Avenue. Mm -hmm. And walk past tailored women, tailored women and sacks and depinas, and pick out the clothes that I would have when I was a successful writer. Mm. Is that bound up somehow in your faith, in your sense of hope, that sort of God had a plan for Mary Higgins' clothes? Well, I don't know how anybody can live without faith. I just don't. Mm -hmm. I have been a devout Catholic all these years, and. Uh, Happily so. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think when you really get these curves, mm -hmm. it would be so easy to despair. Mm -hmm. You look fantastic. You are obviously Good makeup active. Lover. No, it's not that. <laughs> and your mind is so active. Is this work part of the secret of keeping oh, you so active? Oh, I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. I would not want to uh, be just sitting home even reading a book, would, and I love to read, mm -hmm. or getting hooked on television shows, and, yeah. and I like some shows very much, and mm -hmm. uh, some of them are really excellent, yeah. but that would not be for me. I enjoy, I mean, tonight I'm going to our writers group, and it's Susan Isaacs, Nelson DeMille, Harlan Coben. We have such a, Linda Fairstein. Wow. You're slumming them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have such a good time together. And what do you all do with these? You read work? You read work? Oh, no, no, no. We just hang out. Just hang out and gossip. In the beginning, we used to talk about what we were doing, but then we said, no, let's not do that. Let's just hang out. Oh, how nice. But one, the first Tuesday of every month. Mm. And there'll be anywhere from five to ten of us there, depending on on, you know, who's out of town, who's yeah. peddling books. Wow, uh, it's fantastic. But it's great fun to uh, do it. It sounds it sounds it. I want to talk about the way I see your faith in these books, and every one of them, almost to a character. Your heroine is an Irish Catholic girl. Somebody well, who, I know her. You know, you know this woman. And it, but it's beautiful the way you work in the sacraments. Here you have the sacrament of the sick being administered, and, and things happen when she's on her way to daily mass. Um, I, I was flipping back through our library. Where are, the, where are you now? Dealt with post-abortive trauma, a woman who's had an abortion. Tell me about that and why you decided to work that in. Very rarely is that topic, the mm -hmm. after effects of abortion tackled Did she fiction. actually have it or did she have the baby? She had the baby. That's but, what I thought. Right, but someone she, else had it and she was, she was de she, I think she was reflecting on others who had gone through with an abortion. Isn't that in? Well, of course, I'm so. Uh, uh, I cannot even imagine discussing that I. There would be any ambivalence mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. about the way I feel about it. But uh, the the values, the moral values, are there in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see them closing the door, and then uh, you don't go into the bedroom with people. Right. But I have always felt the sexiest line written in the 20th century was in Gone with the Wind. Oh, yeah. You'll not shut me out of your bedroom tonight, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Uh, but that's a lot sexier mm -hmm. than description. Gratuitous, yeah, description. Gratuitous. It's, mm -hmm. it's infinitely more. In the same sense, Hitchcock, psycho, that mm. the shower scene is the scariest scene with all that they can do with pyrotechnics, techniques, or whatever the blazes it is, sure. that's the scariest 14 seconds ever recorded. Yeah. yeah. You never, you see her silhouette, but you don't see her naked body. Mm -hmm. You see the knife going, mm -hmm. but you never see her stabbed. Yeah. And then you see water and blood running down. Mm -hmm. And people still scream when they see that. Yeah. So I have always wanted to write like that. Mm -hmm and feel as though I can scare people. One woman ran into me in the hairdresser last week and she said, I read Where Are the Children? And she said, it frightened me to death. I have never read another one of your books. 
<laughs> I said, well, there are 30, 41 more. Give it a try. Yeah, that's right. Try, try your luck at it. You might like one of them. That's a great book, though, and it is terrifying, though, for parents. It's terrifying. The, I, last year, I think you came out with the book, The Lost Years, which was about a letter Jesus wrote to Joseph of Arimathea. Right. That was sort of the central axis upon which right. the story spun. Tell me where that came from, the idea for that story. The idea came from Michael Gorda, mm -hmm. my editor of all these years. Sure. And a legend and, in, in the truth. And we, uh, we discuss a plot. I might say, Michael, I have the best idea. Yeah. Or he might say, Mary, I was thinking, mm -hmm. as he did last year, to have a biblical reference in your book. Say a letter that Christ wrote to someone. I said, Michael, in a suspense novel, I said, that could be... <laughs> It could be sacrilegious, uh, irreverent, mm -hmm. but I kept coming back to it. Oh. And I thought, well, Jesus was a Jewish boy who went to temple three times a day. Mm -hmm. At 12, he was teaching the elders in the temple and discussing the scriptures, which he had clearly read and understood mm -hmm. with them. And I, Joseph of Arimathea had the tomb where he was buried, and on Palm Sunday, one of the Psalms is, Joseph of Arimathea, a good and just man, and a secret disciple of Christ, had the courage to go to Pontius Pilate and request the body. The body. And I thought Christ would have anticipated that. Um. I can assume that Joseph was at the temple at Passover when Jesus was 12. Mm. Don't forget, it was only 21 years later. Right, right. And might have recognized that he had seen the Messiah mm. because when at the circumcision, uh, two people recognized that, two old people, right, that he was the I Messiah. can die now, I have seen the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So Joseph could have overheard, mm -hmm. thy, father, my, thy father and I have sought thee somewhere away. So I thought you could do that without it being sacrilegious. Yeah. And you did. You pulled it off. I, I felt that it was okay. Mm -hmm. How do you want people to remember you as a woman and as a writer? As a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a good friend. Well, you've certainly been that, I know, to a number of people, not only here, but all across the country and the world. <laughs> Before we go, one of the things I loved most about Mary was her mischievous sense of humor. She offered me a little counsel during the first interview I did with her about how she came up with certain characters for her work, and she gave me this advice. I am told you occasionally off your enemies in your books. <laughs> Is that true? Oh, well, you know, I joke about that. You know, you have the plumber doesn't show up. <laughs> for the three months that the kitchen is out of, is being renovated, yeah. and I can visualize it. <laughs> <laughs> being bludgeoned over the being head with a lead pipe. <laughs> oh, no, I joke about the fact you can get all your meanness out, you know, when, uh, sure. by murdering a few people, you know. <laughs> in it, print, in print. In print, purely in print. May Mary Higgins Clark rest in peace. She was so kind and good to me for so many years and a supporter of my work. God bless her and may she rest in peace. That's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Father Gerald Murray, Robert Royal, the Papal Posse returns to discuss the soon-to-be-released apostolic exhortation on the Amazon Synod and much more. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.